Okay. So, um, yeah. Amy and I hope you're here. Um, I can't see you yet, but I see that you've dialed in. Um, Damien Mander is uh, another um, hero for wildlife on the African continent. Um, he has trained hundreds of uh, women wildlife rangers to protect wilderness and deter illegal animal killings. Um, he's the founder of the group um, International Anti-Poaching Foundation, as well as the Akashinga group, um, which translated to English means the brave ones. And it's a community-led women-led organization to protect nature. Um, in places where these groups are active, poaching is down by more than 80%. So I think it, it says a lot about um, the power of, of women leadership and about the, the models that Damien has developed and scaled. Um, so Damien, if you can join us, um, we'd love to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, uh, World Hope Forum. And of course, uh, our partners and good friends uh, at OCE. G'day Tiff, g'day Ivy, how you doing guys? Cool. Well, yeah, thank you very much again uh, for having me. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk specifically about uh, one of our programs that has evolved, I would say not only the, over the 14 years since we founded the organization back in 2009, but after 25 years of lessons. Uh, and those lessons come from uh, a military background, having been deployed uh, in the Middle East for three years, uh, working as part of Australian Special Operations. When I came to Africa in 2009, I was enraged at what was happening with elephant and rhino uh, and decided uh, I wanted to liquidate my life savings in Australia, which consisted of a, a real estate portfolio and set up an organization to be the last line of defense for wildlife. And in particular, those elephants and rhinos that were being targeted by those militarized type tactics. Uh, coming from the military, I naturally fell into cadence with that side of conservation because it's all I, I understood. Uh, and it took, it took the better part of eight years to actually realize that conservation is, is not a conservation issue. It's a social issue. And when we have social impact, we have conservation outcomes. We just didn't know how to go about it the best way. So of course, in the beginning, uh, with IAPF, the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. And, and I will just say we, we're in the process of being rebranded to be Akashingo, the program that I'm going to speak about. But in the beginning, it was very much, I mean, think of the security component of conservation, uh, the rangers that are out there defending the natural heritage of this world. And I was, I was inspired by them. Uh, these people that are out there uh, leaving their family for up to 11 months of the year, working for as, little, as $100 a month. I just come from Iraq working within a $600 billion a year annual defense budget, fighting for resources in the ground and, and, and dotted lines on a map. And these guys are protecting the heart and lungs of the planet. And it, it made me have a really good look, at not only at, at what I was doing, but what I could do. Uh, as we scaled up over the years, uh, we started to take on bigger and bigger projects, uh, one of which was protecting the eastern flank of Kruger National Park, which at the time uh, in South Africa, uh, we were on the Mozambique side of the border, and you can see the borderline down there uh, on that uh, that picture from the sky uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, Kruger is home to about, around a third of the world's remaining uh, rhino population at that site. And at, at, the, at the time, rhinos had been declared locally extinct in Mozambique, and we uh, scoped an agreement with the government. We went, up, went in there, and we set up this ground-level offensive against the local population where all these syndicates were operating from, up to 75% of rhino poachers that were coming into Kruger uh, and killing rhino were coming from Mozambique. And so we saw this piece of land that separated the syndicates and the rhinos as the most critical piece of land on the planet for rhino conservation. Uh, and we scaled up this operation. We, we ended up having 165 personnel, four different government departments. We had helicopters, we had aircraft, canine attack teams. We, we built big offenses. Uh, and we had more guns. And I would go to bed at night knowing that what we were doing was not the answer. We were very successful in stopping rhino poachers uh, from coming through that area. Uh, but there's only so many times you can look into the eyes of uh, a mother, uh, a wife, a daughter, a son, uh, whose, whose husband, uncle, brother uh, had been killed in Kruger National Park trying to poach rhino. Uh, or is serving a long prison sentence. Uh, I didn't know how to join the dots between conservation and community, and this seemed to be so fragmented. Uh, that bridge had been broken, uh, and it, it, it was this very much fortress conservation model. 
draw a line in the sand and defend it because if we don't hold on to it there's going to be nothing left i would i would explain it as though uh think of think of what we were doing as being a paramedic uh, trying to stop the hemorrhaging trying to get this situation to the operating table until we can come up with a better solution at the same time i'm reading there's going to be two billion people on the african continent by 2040 uh, and it goes without saying that people, Africa's most important asset, will decide the future of conservation uh, on this continent, not bigger fences and more guns. We started looking at other industries that were getting ahead by getting more women in power positions, more women uh, on the boards, more women as CEOs, as managers, organizations that were creating career paths for women. Uh, we overlaid that with conservation and saw that in, in, in many cases, women were outnumbered in genuine field-based roles by as much as 100 to 1. Uh, now, the largest line items in our budget are a range of salaries, uh, and not only range of salaries, but ranges that were offered in, often uh, employed from hundreds of miles away, so they weren't influenced by the communities they grew up with to give away critical information about where high-target species such as elephant and rhino may be going. Uh, and so, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, <laughs> let me just check my notes. Sorry. And, uh, we, and, and we saw a lot of tokenism that was happening, uh, in the conservation industry, women that were being portrayed as being able to do certain role, uh, doing certain roles, but in actual fact, they weren't being given the full opportunity. So if they weren't being given the full opportunity to do those roles, then they didn't have the chance to genuinely rise up into those management positions. Uh, and I thought, well, if, if we as an industry can't create those opportunities for women to get ahead and to move into these management positions and these power roles, then can we progress like other industry, industries? And if we can't, what are we facing uh, with so much burden sitting on our shoulders as conservationists looking after the future of the planet? The thing that tipped me over the line was uh, reading an article in the New York Times about two uh, female soldiers uh, about to graduate from US Army Ranger School. A decade before reading that, uh, our convoy had been blown up in northern Baghdad. Uh, a few people had been killed. Uh, we were in a pretty bad situation. Uh, and fortunately, the US Army Rangers came and got us out of that situation uh, alive uh, and got us back to the nearest forward, forward operating base. Uh, Reading that article a decade later, I thought, well, if the US Army Rangers are training women to be wildlife range, uh, to be Army Rangers, then why can't we train women to be wildlife rangers as well? And that's when we set out to try and find an area uh, that would accept this trial program of starting up what would become Africa's first all female armed anti poaching unit. And we tried in seven different places. We were given closed doors. Uh, nobody wanted to take the risk uh, in, in what is quite often a very patriarchal society uh, and a very male-led industry in many, in, in many countries. Uh, nobody wanted to take the risk of putting women into this role. Uh, we had a look across the continent. And now across the continent, there's more than twice as much wilderness area held under communal or tribal land trust. So the indigenous and local communities are custodians of that land. There's more than twice as, twice as much of that as what there is in national parks. Now, the decline of the trophy hunting industry, which has been an, a traditional economic model for some of these communities uh, in Zimbabwe, led us to, uh, to find an abandoned trophy hunting uh, area uh, in the lower Zambezi area of, of Zimbabwe. Uh, we went and spoke with the traditional leaders, uh, the chiefs, the village heads, I said, listen, this is what we want to do. We want to try and start this all-female anti-poaching unit and see where it goes. Uh, we managed to negotiate uh, only three days. That's all they would give us. Uh, they thought that would be enough time to demonstrate that this is a failed theory and that we would resort to the more traditional model of having males out there doing the job of being a, a wildlife ranger. When I first arrived in Zimbabwe in 2009, it had the lowest life expectancy in the world for a woman. I was less than 40 years of age. Uh, and so when we started this program and we put the word out into the communities uh, through the local government uh, and through the tr uh, traditional leadership, uh, we said, if we're gonna create an opportunity and this goes beyond three days, let's create an opportunity for the most marginalized. And they were survivors of serious uh, or sexual assault, domestic violence, AIDS orphans, single mothers, 
uh, and abandoned wives. Uh, what we didn't realize at the time is that we we're actually getting the toughest. We started uh, from the 87 that came down uh, to the pre-selection interviews. We started selection with 37 uh, women. Now I've built a career uh, across three continents in training men for frontline uh, deployment, be it in conservation, law enforcement, and military. Uh, halfway through day one with these women, we knew we had something extremely special, something that I hadn't seen uh, before in, in, in all the forces that I'd trained or been involved with. And I'd never, I'd never, never deployed with a women, woman before uh, in an operational sense. Uh, the distance that a person can place between suffering and breaking is what defines the spirit of the individual, the character. And that's all we need. The rest we can train to be a ranger. And these women, they had it in spades. The responsibility uh, very quickly uh, shifted uh, from us as instructors, uh, from those women, in, uh, sorry, in regards to proving themselves to us that they were capable of this job. The responsibility came to us as instructors to prepare them for deployment because this is definitely going to go beyond three days. Uh, and the area that they would go out into, the lower Zambezi section of Zimbabwe, had lost 8,000 elephants in the previous 16 years to armed poachers. So while we could hope for the best, we had to prepare for the worst. The training was extremely arduous. Uh, we actually made it harder than the training that we'd put the men through because in the eyes of everybody, pretty much everybody, they had more to prove. Today, six years later, uh, looking back on the journey that we've had with Akashinga and Akashinga, which translates into the brave ones, a name that the women gave for themselves. Akashinga delivers ecological stability and long-term protection of large-scale wilderness landscapes by supporting and empowering local communities. Now, I'm going to tell you how that happened. We started with 16 women uh, from that initial 37 women. Uh, we started with no infrastructure under a tree, on a chalkboard, sleeping in canvas tents. And today it's grown to a project uh, that has 9.1 million acres under contract across four countries uh, with almost 600 staff and contractors over the past six years. The first thing that we noticed uh, as a point of difference when we were working with women uh, in this role is that there was no corruption. Uh, we, we just didn't see any corruption. Now, if Denmark ranks number one as the least corrupt country on the planet, Zimbabwe sits at 157 out of 180 countries on the planet, the global corruption uh, index. Now, if you can remove corruption from anything you're doing here, you're already halfway home to achieving whatever it is you're trying to do. And the fact that we didn't have this corruption meant that we didn't have to employ from hundreds of kilometers away we can employ directly from the communities that neighbored the area we were trying to protect, which turned the largest light line item in our budgets, the salaries for rangers, uh, from being something that was previously dispersed around the country to something that was now going uh, into communities at household level into the hands of women. Uh, we looked at, this was a, pre, this was a, a, a historically a trophy hunting area. Uh, we looked at trophy hunting in the previous two years uh, to us taking over and what that had invested in the local community versus what we invested in our first two years. And we saw that we were able to put the same amount into the local community every 34 days as what trophy hunting had done per annum. So with women at the center of this conservation strategy, we actually had a viable economic alternative to trophy hunting. The second thing we, we saw and probably the most profound, uh, and again, with economic uh, implications uh, or ramifications that, that were, uh, of course, positive, was a de-escalation intention. Uh, women seem to have a different value system in a law enforcement environment. Uh, a, a weapon is not a toy. It's a tool to do a job as a last resort. Uh, de-escalation in law enforcement means demilitarization. Uh, and so we stopped spending money on helicopters and aircraft and canine attack teams and bigger fences and more guns. Uh, we found something much more powerful than biceps and bullets, and that was relationships uh, that the women were driving at community level, at household level, in the communities they were raised in, the communities they were raising their own children in. And that was the most powerful thing that I've ever seen in conservation. 
in the in the lower Zambezi Valley, there's a small group of women that have achieved what very few armies and police forces in, in history have been able to achieve, and that is to win the hearts and minds of a local population. The money that we started to save, and, and we were spending now one third per acre per annum on law enforcement because we weren't spending on all, all this military grade hardware, we we're investing into women, employing women. And that natural value system was doing the rest in, re in regards to rebuilding that bridge uh, back into the community and making conservation and community one again. The money that we started to save, uh, we started investing uh, into healthcare uh, by supporting clinics, electrifying clinics, uh, getting registered nurses, getting drugs into clinics, into remote areas where something as simple as, a, as antibiotics or malarial treatment is the difference between life and death. This is something that radiates out through the whole, the whole community. It's an asset for everyone to share. Education, uh, rebuilding schools, kindergartens, uh, funding hundreds of scholarships for disadvantaged children that would otherwise not be able to attend school. Again, a far reaching impact throughout these communities. And this is all while the model is, is evolving over these last six years and into what we now call our toolbox uh, of community development. Providing clean water uh, in areas where they just wouldn't have access to, or, or mostly women are walking uh, up to 10 miles to collect water. Uh, the simple act of drilling a borehole, supplying a clinic with that water, supplying a community so they can grow gardens, supplying a school with water. Uh, again, it, it was all part of getting the community on side. It was either, it was either gonna be a small group of rangers uh, and people working inside the reserve, looking out at the community, or it was gonna be us with the community shoulder to shoulder looking in. So we went from being a small force, what we had in Mozambique, to actually having the entire weight of the community behind us. And, and that, that became the motivation for conservation. And it's actually what allowed us to be able to scale so rapidly in what we do. Now, the impact that this had, uh, one of, the, one of the, the great things about having a good relationship with the local community is the sharing of information. When illegal activities are taking place, they will tell you where those those uh, those activities are happening, uh, and in conservation, with the limited resources we have, you can either patrol the area, uh, an area the size of a small country, hoping to bump into something, or you can go exactly uh, where the problem is. And to date, just in Zimbabwe alone, uh, the women of Akashinga and the Wildlife Crime Unit have made over twelve hundred arrests uh, for nearly eight hundred prosecutions, with a, a prosecution, uh, sorry, a, a conviction rate of eighty four point five percent. Uh, the work in the mid to lower Zambezi region alone has helped drive a 90% downturn in elephant poaching, which is a great indicator species for that ecosystem. I think the best endorsement that we got was we expanded out in, in the mid to lower Zambezi, but then we started having other chiefs, uh, other traditional leaders and other sectors of government coming to us not only in Zimbabwe, but around the region and asking us to expand this model. And as we started looking across the Zambezi Valley section of Zimbabwe, we saw it as a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and within that jigsaw puzzle are the national parks. They're, and they're, they're sort of nailed to the page. They're not going anywhere. They're controlled by federal mandate. It's all the pieces that separate those areas that are owned and mandated by the local communities, the traditional leaders, uh, the custodians of these lands that we were going into partnership with. Uh, and those areas were the ones that were being lost. Now, hunting is not uh, traditionally a good economic, uh, sorry, a good uh, nonprofit partner. And so when hunting had previously failed, there was no one left to pick up the slack. So we're not going out competing with hunting organizations to try and take over these areas. We're going where nobody else is going. We're going to the lost causes in conservation. And, and from an Akashinga sense, uh, from our sense, the lost causes are the best ones worth fighting for. We wanted to create the corridors or reestablish the corridors, and we wanted to be on the peripherals of these ecosystems from, because from a strategic standpoint, they gave us the footprint with which to have the relationship with the community, which is the most valuable part of the entire model itself. As we built out this model uh, in Zimbabwe and refined what we learned, we started taking it to other countries. Uh, and those countries now, uh, Botswana, uh, in southwest Botswana, uh, over 5 million acres um, of 
uh, land uh, that was previously used for trophy hunting, uh, where the Akashinga model has already uh, expanded to have 88 staff uh, in just the past 18 months alone. Uh, Mozambique, uh, just north from where Andrea is working, uh, yeah, uh, just north of the Sabi River um, in an area called Katata 5. Uh, this area is, uh, if you include the, the, the greater sector, which goes all the way to the coastline, includes 10% of Mozambique's entire mangrove system uh, and around 40 miles of coastline there. Um, so it's very strategic, um, uh, not only piece of uh, um, coastal area, um, but the, the terrestrial area as well used to be home to some of the highest populations of, of herbivores uh, in the country. I think the, the important thing for us is just being the, the ability or the willingness to evolve over time and to learn from mistakes uh, and to be able to accept uh, that there are different ways of doing things and not to be afraid to, to challenge, challenge the norm and think outside the box. Uh, and it's been this that has allowed us to, to create this holistic model of conservation uh, that's not only opened us up uh, to wider funding within the, the the conservation sector but if you take healthcare and education alone in the us the biggest philanthropic market uh in the world uh education and healthcare alone is almost eight times the market space for fundraising so if you build in a holistic model and put people at the forefront of conservation uh there's great opportunities for these communities to flourish but for conservation organizations that carry the burden of social development on our shoulders as well as the conservation work that we have to do uh, there's great opportunity for us to tap into alternate markets. I'll, I'll close by saying, you know, we're at a time here in civilization where we've recently been brought to our knees as a, as a global community uh, because of a pandemic. Uh, and that is a direct result of the way we treat nature. Uh, we turn on the news, we see the world on fire, we see it flooding, we see it heating up. Uh, we have a system that's evolved over nearly 5 billion years, and it is the most effective system we will ever have, and that is nature. Uh, we stopped looking at species in isolation and parks in isolation. We started looking at landscapes. What are the biggest possible landscapes that we can protect in each of the countries that we operate? Uh, and that is what Akashinga is, is about, protecting landscapes at scale, these wide open ecosystems with that rich tapestry of biodiversity upon which our future as a civilization is dependent. Uh, thank you very much for having me on today, guys. Thank you. Damien, thank you. everybody ahead, is Lee. crazy <laughs> about your speech <laughs> and your ideas. They want you to do this for the world. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we're in the process of 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 building these programs out. Um, Tanzania is is a is a new uh, project for us that we're in the process of uh, just finalising the paperwork, and we're going there. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, there's no shortage uh, of wilderness across the continent at threat of being lost. Um, I'm currently sitting on the advisory board for URSA, the Universal Ranger Support Alliance, which adv advises the International Ranger Federation and nearly 90 governments around the world. Uh, on gender equity, diversity and rights uh, within the conservation workspace and how we can be more inclusive um, of women uh, in these roles and, and get them in to, uh, into these conservation uh, frontline roles to be able to develop the skills they need and the career paths uh, to be able to go on beyond conservation, but with that con conservation ethic uh, ingrained in their thinking. 